Hello again, this is David with Practice Love Media, and we're in part five of Ralph Waldo Trines, In Tune with the Infinite. This is Wisdom and Interior Illumination. This is the spirit of infinite wisdom, and in the degree that we open ourselves to it, does the highest wisdom manifest itself to and through us. We can in this way go to the very heart of the universe itself and find the mysteries hidden to the majority of mankind. Hidden to them, though not hidden of themselves. In order for the highest wisdom and insight, we must have absolute confidence in the divine guiding us, but not through the channel of someone else. And why should we go to another for knowledge and wisdom? With God is no respect of persons. Why should we seek these things secondhand? Why should we thus stultify our own innate powers? Why should we not go direct to the infinite source itself? If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Before they call, I will answer, and while they are yet speaking, I will hear. When we thus go directly to the infinite source itself, we are no longer slaves to personalities, institutions, or books. We should always keep ourselves open to the suggestions of truth from these agencies, but we should always regard them as agencies, however, and never as sources. We should never recognize them as masters, but simply as teachers. With Browning, we must recognize the great fact that truth is within ourselves. It takes no rise. From outward things, whate'er you may believe, there is an inmost center in us all, where truth abides in fullness. There is no more important injunction in all the world nor one with a deeper interior meaning than to thine own self be true. In other words, be true to your own soul, for it is through your own soul that the voice of God speaks to you. This is the interior guide. This is the light that lighteth every man and cometh into the world. This is conscience, this is intuition. This is the voice of higher self, the voice of the soul, the voice of God. Thou shalt hear a voice behind thee saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. When Moses was on the mountain, it was after the various physical commotions and manifestations that he heard the still, small voice, the voice of his own soul, through which the infinite God was speaking. If we will but follow this voice of intuition, it will speak ever more clearly and more plainly, until by and by it will be absolute and unerring in its guidance. The great trouble with us is that we do not listen to and do not follow this voice within our own souls, and so we become as a house divided against itself. We are pulled this way and that, and we are never certain of anything. I have a friend who listens so carefully to this inner voice, who, in other words, always acts so quickly and so fully in accordance with his intuitions, and whose life, as a consequence, is so absolutely guided by them that he always does the right thing at the right time and in the right way. He always knows when to act and how to act, and he is never in the condition of a house divided against itself. But someone says, may it not be dangerous for us to act always upon our intuitions? 
Suppose we should have an intuition to do harm to someone. We need not be afraid of this, however, for the voice of the soul, this voice of God speaking through the soul, will never direct one to do harm to another, nor to do anything that is not in accordance with the highest standards of right and truth and justice. And, if you at any time have the prompting of this kind, know that it is not the voice of intuition. It is some characteristic of your lower self that is prompting you. Reason is not to be set aside, but it is to be continually illumined by this higher spiritual perception. And in the degree that it is thus illumined, will it become an agent of light and power. When one becomes thoroughly individualized, he enters into the realm of all knowledge and wisdom. And to be individualized is to recognize no power outside of the infinite power that is in back of us all. When one recognizes this great fact and opens himself to this spirit of infinite wisdom, he then enters upon the road to the true education, and the mysteries that before were closed now reveal themselves to him. This must indeed be the foundation of all true education, this evolving from within, this evolving of what has been involved by the infinite power. All things that it is valuable for us to know will come to us if we will but open ourselves to the voice of this infinite spirit. It is thus that we become seers and have the power of seeing into the very heart of things. There are no new stars, there are no new laws or forces, but we can so open ourselves to this spirit of infinite wisdom that we can discover and recognize those that have not been known before. And in this way, they become new to us. When in this way, we come into a knowledge of truth, we no longer need facts that are continually changing. We can then enter into the quiet of our own interior selves. We can open the window and look out and thus gather the facts as we choose. This is true wisdom. Wisdom is the knowledge of God. Wisdom comes by intuition. It far transcends knowledge. Great knowledge, knowledge of many things, may be had by virtue of simply a very retentive memory. It comes by tuition. But wisdom far transcends knowledge, and in that knowledge is a mere incident of this deeper wisdom. He who would enter into the realm of wisdom must first divest himself of all intellectual pride. He must become as a little child. Prejudices, preconceived opinions, and beliefs always stand in the way of true wisdom. Conceited opinions, are always suicidal in their influences. They bar the door to the entrance of truth. All about us we see men in the religious world, in the world of science, in the political and social world, who through intellectual pride are so wrapped in their own conceits and prejudices that larger and later revelations of truth can find no entrance to them and instead of growing and expanding, they are becoming dwarfed and stunted and still more incapable of receiving truth. Instead of actively aiding in the progress of the world, they are as so many dead sticks in the way that would retard the wheels of progress. This, however, they can never do. Such always in time get bruised, broken, and left behind while God's triumphal car of truth moves steadily onward. 
when the steam engine was still being experimented with, and before it was perfected sufficiently to come into practical use, a well-known Englishman, well-known then in scientific circles, wrote an extended pamphlet proving that it would be impossible for it ever to be used in ocean navigation, that is, in a trip involving the crossing of the ocean, because it would be utterly impossible for any vessel to carry with it sufficient coal for the use of its furnace. And the interesting feature of the whole matter was that the very first steam vessel that made the trip from England to America had among its cargo a part of the first edition of this carefully prepared pamphlet. There was only the one edition. Many editions might be sold now. This seems indeed an amusing fact, but far more amusing is the man who voluntarily closes himself to truth because, forsooth, it does not come through conventional or orthodox or heretofore accepted channels, or because it may not be in full accord with, or possibly may be opposed to, established usages or beliefs. On the contrary, let there be many windows in your soul that all the glory of the universe may beautify it. Not the narrow pain of one poor creed can catch the radiant rays that shine from countless sources. Tear away the blinds of superstition. Let the light pour through fair windows broad as truth itself and high as heaven. Tune your ear to all the worldless music of the stars and to the voice of nature, and your heart shall turn to truth and goodness as the plant turns to the sun. A thousand unseen hands reach down to help you to their peace-crowned heights, and all the forces of the firmament shall fortify your strength. Be not afraid to thrust aside half-truths and grasp the whole. There is a great law in connection with the coming of truth. It is this. Whenever a man or woman shuts himself or herself to the entrance of truth on account of intellectual pride, preconceived opinions, prejudices, or for whatever reason, there is a great law which says that truth in its fullness will come to that one from no source. And on the other hand, when a man or a woman opens himself or herself fully to the entrance of truth from whatever source it may come, there is an equally great law which says that truth will flow into him or to her from all sources, from all quarters. Such becomes the free man, the free woman, for it is the truth that makes us free. The other remains in bondage, for truth has had no invitation and will not enter where it is not fully and freely welcomed. And where truth is denied entrance, the rich blessings it carries with it cannot take up their abode. On the contrary, when this is the case, it sends an envoy carrying with it atrophy, disease, death, physically and spiritually, as well as intellectually. And the man who would rob another of his free and unfettered search for truth, who would stand as the interpreter of truth for another, with the intent of remaining in this position rather than endeavoring to lead him to the place where he can be his own interpreter, is more to be shunned than a thief and a robber. The injury he works is far greater, for he is doing direct and positive injury to the very life of the one he thus holds. Who has ever appointed any man, whoever he may be, as the keeper, the custodian, the dispenser of God's illimitable truth. Many indeed are moved and so are called to be teachers of truth. 
But the true teacher will never stand as the interpreter of truth for another. The true teacher is the one whose endeavor is to bring the one he teaches to a true knowledge of himself and hence of his own interior powers, that he may become his own interpreter. All others are, generally speaking, those animated by purely personal motives, self-aggrandizement, or personal gain. Moreover, he who would claim to have all truth and the only truth is a bigot, a fool, or a knave. In the Eastern literature is a fable of a frog. The frog lived in a well, and out of his little well he had never been. One day a frog whose home was in the sea came to his well. Interested in all things, he went in. Who are you? Where do you live? said the frog in the well. I am so-and-so, and my home is in the sea. The sea? What is that? Where is that? It is a very large body of water and not far away. How big is your sea? Oh, very big. As big as this, pointing to a little stone lying near? Oh, much bigger. As big as this, pointing to the board upon which they were sitting? Oh, much bigger. How much bigger then? Why, the sea in which I live is bigger than your entire well. It would make millions of wells such as yours. Nonsense, nonsense. You are a deceiver and a falsifier. Get out of my well, get out of my well. I want nothing to do with any such frogs as you. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free is the promise. Ye shall close yourselves to truth. Ye shall live in your own conceits, and your own conceits shall make fools and idiots of you would be a statement applicable not to a few and not to a few who pride themselves upon their superior intellectual attainments. Idiocy is arrested mental growth. Closing oneself for whatever reason to the truth and hence to growth brings a certain type of idiocy, though it may be not called by this name. And on the other hand, Another type, that is arrested growth caused by taking all things for granted without proving them for oneself, merely because they come from a particular person, a particular book, a particular institution. This is caused by one's always looking without instead of being true to the light within and carefully tending it that it may give an ever clearer light. With brave and intrepid Walt Whitman, we should all be able to say, From this hour, I ordain myself loosed of limits and imaginary lines. Going where I list, my own master, total and absolute. Listening to others, considering well what they say. Pausing, searching, receiving, contemplating gently, but with undeniable will, divesting myself of the holds that would hold me. Great should be the joy that God's boundless truth is open to all, open equally to all, and that it will make each one its dwelling place in proportion as he earnestly desires it and opens himself to it. And in regard to the wisdom that guides us in our daily life, there is nothing that is right and well for us to know that may not be known when we recognize the law of its coming and are able wisely to use it. Let us know that all things are ours as soon as we know how to appropriate them. I hold it as a changeless law from which no soul can sway or swerve. We have that in us which will draw whate'er we need.
or most deserve. If the time comes when we know not what course to pursue, when we know not which way to turn, the fault lies in ourselves. If the fault lies in ourselves, then the correction of this unnatural condition lies also in ourselves. It is never necessary to come into such a state if we are awake and remain awake to the light and the powers within us. The light is ever shining and the only thing that it is necessary for us diligently to see to is that we permit neither this thing or that to come between us and the light. With thee is the fountain of life. In thy light we shall see light. Let us hear the words of one of the most highly illumined men I have ever known and one who as a consequence is never in the dark when the time comes as to what to do and how to do it. Whenever you are in doubt as to the course you should pursue after you have turned to every outward means of guidance, let the inward eye see, let the inward ear hear, and allow this simple, natural, beautiful process to go on unimpeded by questionings or doubts. In all dark hours and times of unwanted perplexity, we need to follow one simple direction, found, as all needed directions can be found, in the dear old gospel, which so many read, but alas, so few interpret. Enter into thine inner chamber and shut the door. Does this mean that we must literally betake ourselves to a private closet with a key in the door? If it did, then the command could never be obeyed in the open air, on land or sea. And Christ loved the lakes and the forests far better than the cramping rooms of city dwelling houses. Still, his counsels are so wide reaching that there is no spot on earth and no conceivable situation in which any of us may be placed where we cannot follow them. One of the most intuitive men we ever met had a desk in a city office where several other gentlemen were doing business constantly and often talking loudly. Entirely undisturbed by the many various sounds about him, this self-centered, faithful man would, in any moment of perplexity, draw the curtains of his privacy so completely about him that he would be as fully enclosed in his own psychic aura, and thereby as effectually removed from all distractions as though he were alone in some primeval wood. Taking his difficulty with him into the mystic silence in the form of a direct question, to which he expected a certain answer, he would remain utterly passive until the reply came, and never once through many years' experience did he find himself disappointed or misled. Intuitive perceptions of truth are the daily bread to satisfy our daily hunger. They come like the manna in the desert day by day. Each day brings adequate supply for that day's need only. They must be followed instantly, for dalliance with them means their obscuration. And the more we dally, the more we invite erroneous impressions to cover intuition with a pall of conflicting moral fantasies born in illusions of the Terence will. One condition is imposed by universal law, and this we must obey. Put all wishes aside save the one desire to know truth. Couple this with one demand, the fully consecrated determination to follow what is distinctly perceived as truth immediately as it is revealed. No other affection must be permitted to share the field with this all-absorbing love of truth, 
for its own sake. Obey this one direction and never forget that expectation and desire are bride and bridegroom and forever inseparable and you will soon find your hitherto darkened way grow luminous with celestial radiance. For with the heaven within, all heavens without incessantly cooperate. This may be termed going into the silence. This it is to perceive and to be guided by the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. This it is to listen to and to be guided by the voice of your own soul, the voice of your higher self. The soul is divine, and in allowing it to become translucent to the infinite spirit, it reveals all things to us. As man turns away from the divine light, do all things become hidden. There is nothing hidden of itself. When the spiritual sense is opened, then it transcends all the limitations of the physical senses and the intellect. And in the degree that we are able to get away from the limitations set by them and realize that so far as the real life is concerned, it is one with the infinite life, then we begin to reach the place where this voice will always speak where it will never fail us if we follow it, and as a consequence, where we will always have the divine illumination and guidance. To know this and to live in this realization is not to live in heaven hereafter, but to live in a heaven here and now, today and every day. No human soul need be without it. When we turn our face in the right direction, it comes as simply and as naturally as the flower blooms and the winds blow. It is not to be bought with money or with price. It is a condition waiting simply to be realized by rich and by poor, by king and by peasant, by master and by servant the world over. All are equal heirs to it, and so the peasant, if he finds it first, lives a life far transcending in beauty and in real power the life of his king. The servant, if he finds it first, lives a life surpassing the life of his master. If you would find the highest and fullest and richest life, that not only this world, but that any world can know. Then do away with the sense of separateness of your life from the life of God. Hold to the thought of your oneness. In the degree that you do this, you will find yourself realizing it more and more. And as this life of realization is lived, you will find that no good thing will be withheld for all things are included in this, then it will be yours without fears or forebodings, simply to do today what your hands find to do. And so be ready for tomorrow when it comes, knowing that tomorrow will bring tomorrow's supply of the mental, the spiritual, and the physical life. Remember, however, that tomorrow's supplies are not needed until tomorrow comes. If one is willing to trust himself fully to the law, the law will never fail him. It is the half-hearted trusting to it that brings uncertain and so unsatisfactory results. Nothing is firmer and surer than deity. It will never fail the one who throws himself wholly upon it. The secret of life, then, is to live continually in this realization. Whatever one may be doing, wherever one may be, by day, by night, both waking and sleeping, it can be lived in while you are sleeping no less than when you are awake. And here shall we consider a few facts in connection with sleep 
in connection with receiving instruction and illumination while asleep? During the process of sleep, it is merely the physical body that is at rest and in quiet. The soul life, with all of its activities, goes right on. Sleep is nature's provision for the recuperation of the body, for the rebuilding and hence the replacing of the waste that is continually going on during the waking hours. It is nature's great restorer. If sufficient sleep is not allowed the body, so that the rebuilding may equalize the wasting process, the body is gradually depleted and weakened, and any ailment or malady, when it is in this condition, is able to find a more ready entrance. It is for this reason that those who are subject to it will take a cold, as we term it, more readily when the body is tired or exhausted through loss of sleep than at most any other time. The body is in that condition where outside influences can have a more ready effect upon it than when it is in its normal condition. And when they do have an effect, they always go to the weaker portions first. Our bodies are given us to serve far higher purposes than we ordinarily use them for. Especially is this true in the numerous cases where the body is master of its owner. In the degree that we come into the realization of the higher powers of the mind and spirit, in that degree does the body, through their influence upon it, become less gross and heavy, finer in its texture and form. And then, because the mind finds a kingdom of enjoyment in itself and in all the higher things it becomes related to, excesses in eating and drinking, as well as all others, naturally and of their own accord, fall away. There also falls away the desire for the heavier, grosser, less valuable kinds of food and drink, such as the flesh of animals, alcoholic drinks, and all things of a class that stimulate the body and the passions rather than build the body and the brain into a strong, clean, well-nourished, enduring, and fibrous condition. In the degree that the body thus becomes less gross and heavy, finer in its texture and form, is there less waste, and what there is is more easily replaced, so that it keeps in a more regular and even condition. When this is true, less sleep is actually required, and even the amount that is taken does more for a body of this finer type than it can do for one of the other nature. As the body in this way grows finer, in other words, as the process of its evolution is thus accelerated, it in turn helps the mind and the soul in the realization of even higher perceptions. And thus, body helps mind the same as mind helps body. It was undoubtedly this fact that Browning had in mind when he said, let us cry, all good things are ours, nor soul helps flesh more now than flesh helps soul. Sleep, then, is for the resting and rebuilding of the body. The soul needs no rest, and while the body is at rest in sleep, the soul is active the same as when the body is in activity. There are some, having a deep insight into the soul's activities, who say that we travel when we sleep. Some are able to recall and bring over into the conscious waking life the scenes visited, the information gained, and the events that have transpired. Most people are not able to do this, and so much that might otherwise be gained is lost. They say, however, that it is in our power, in proportion as we understand the laws, to go where we will, to bring over into the conscious, waking life, 
all the experiences thus gained. Be this, however, as it may, it certainly is true that while sleeping we have the power, in a perfectly normal and natural way, to get much value by way of light, instruction, and growth that the majority of people now miss. If the soul life, that which relates us to the infinite spirit, is always active, even while the body is at rest, why may not the mind so direct conditions as one falls asleep, that while the body is at rest, it may continually receive illumination from the soul and bring what it thus receives over into the conscious waking life. This indeed can be done and is done by some to great advantage. And many times the highest inspirations from the soul come in this way, as would seem most natural since at this time all communications from the outer material world no longer enter. I know those who do much work during sleep, the same as they get much light along desired lines. By charging the mind on going to sleep as to a particular time for waking, it is possible, as many of us know, to wake up on the very minute. Not infrequently, we have examples of difficult problems, problems that defied solution during waking hours, being solved during sleep. A friend, a well-known journalist, had an extended newspaper article clearly and completely worked out for her in this way. She frequently calls this agency to her aid. She was notified by the managing editor one evening to have the article ready in the morning, an article requiring more than ordinary care, and one in which quite a knowledge of facts was required. It was a matter in connection with which he knew scarcely anything, and all her efforts at finding information regarding it seemed to be of no avail. She set to work, but it seemed as if even her own powers defied her, Failure seemed imminent. Almost in desperation, she decided to retire, and putting the matter into her mind in such a way that she would be able to receive the greatest amount of aid while asleep, she fell asleep soundly until morning. When she awoke, her work of the previous evening was the first thing that came into her mind. She lay quietly for a few minutes and as she lay there, the article, completely written, seemed to stand out before her. She ran through it, arose, and without dressing, took her pen and transcribed it onto paper, literally acting simply as her own amanuensis. The mind, acting intently along a particular line, will continue to so act until some other object of thought carries it along another line. And since in sleep only the body is in quiet while the mind and soul are active, then the mind, on being given a certain direction when one drops off to sleep, will take up the line along which it is directed, and can be made in time to bring over into consciousness the results of its activities. Some will be able very soon to get results of this kind. For some, it will take longer. Quiet and continued effort will increase the faculty. Then, by virtue of the law of drawing power of mind, since the mind is always active, we are drawing to us, even while sleeping, influences from the realms kindred to those in which we in our thoughts are living before we fall asleep. In this way, we can put ourselves into relation with whatever kinds of influence we choose and accordingly gain much during the process of sleep. In many ways, the interior faculties are more open and receptive while we are in sleep than while we are awake. 
Hence, the necessity of exercising even greater care as to the nature of the thoughts that occupy the mind as we enter into sleep. For there can come to us only what we, by in our own order of thought, attract. We have it entirely in our own hands. And for the same reason, this greater degree of receptivity during this period, we are able, by understanding and using the law, to gain much of value more readily in this way than when the physical senses are fully open to the material world about us. Many will find a practice somewhat after the following nature of value. When light or information is desired along a particular line, light or information you feel it is right and wise for you to have, as for example, light in regard to an uncertain course in action, then, as you retire, first bring your mind into an attitude of peace and goodwill for all. You, in this way, bring yourself into an harmonious condition and in turn attract to yourself these same peaceful conditions from without. Then, resting in this sense of peace, quietly and calmly send out your earnest desire for the needed light or information. Cast out of your mind all fears or forebodings, lest it not come. For in quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. Take the expectant attitude of mind, firmly believing and expecting that when you awake, the desired results will be with you. Then on awaking, before any thoughts or activities from the outside world come in to absorb the attention, remain for a little while receptive to the intuitions or the impressions that come. When they come, when they manifest themselves clearly, then act upon them without delay. In the degree that you do this, in that degree, will the power of doing it ever more effectively grow. Or, if for unselfish purposes you desire to grow and develop any of your faculties, or to increase the health and strength of your body, take a corresponding attitude of mind, the form of which will readily suggest itself in accordance with your particular needs or desires. In this way, you will open yourself to, you will connect yourself with, and you will set into operation within yourself the particular order of forces that will make for these results. Don't be afraid to voice your desires. In this way, you set into operation the vibratory forces which go out and which make their impress felt somewhere and which, arousing into activity or uniting with other forces, set about to actualize your desires. No good thing shall be withheld from him who lives in harmony with the higher laws and forces. There are no desires that shall not be satisfied to the one who knows and who wisely uses the powers with which he or she is endowed. Your sleep will be more quiet and peaceful and refreshing, and so your power increased mentally, physically, and spiritually, simply by sending out, as you fall asleep, thoughts of love and goodwill, thoughts of peace and harmony for all. In this way, you are connecting yourself with all the forces of the universe that make for peace and harmony. A friend who has known the world over through his work along humane lines, has told me that many times in the middle of the night he is awakened suddenly and there comes to his mind, as a flash of inspiration, a certain plan in connection with his work. 
And as he lays there quietly and opens himself to it, the methods for its successful carrying out all reveal themselves to him clearly. In this way, many plans are entered upon and brought into a successful culmination that otherwise would never be thought of, plans that seem indeed marvelous to the world at large. He is a man with a sensitive organism, his life in thorough harmony with the higher laws, and given wholly and unreservedly to the work to which he has dedicated it. Just how and from what source these inspirations comes, he does not fully know. Possibly no one does, though each may have his theory. But this we do know, and it is all we need to know now, at least, that to the one who lives in harmony with higher laws of his being, and who opens himself to them, they come. Visions and inspirations of the highest order will come in the degree that we make for them the right conditions. One who has studied deeply into the subject in hand has said, to receive education spiritually while the body is resting in sleep is a perfectly normal and orderly experience and would occur definitely and satisfactorily in the lives of us all if we paid more attention to internal and consequently less to external states with their supposed but unreal necessities. Our thoughts make us what we are here and hereafter, and our thoughts are often busier by night than by day. For when we are asleep to the exterior, we can be wide awake to the interior world. And the unseen world is a substantial place, the conditions of which are entirely regulated by mental and moral attainments. When we are not deriving information through outward avenues of sensation, we are receiving instruction through interior channels of perception. And when this fact is understood for what it is worth, it will become a universal custom for persons to take to sleep with them the special subject on which they most earnestly desire. The pharaoh type of person dreams, and so does his butler and baker. But the Joseph type, which is that of the truly gifted seer, both dreams and interprets. But why had not Pharaoh the power of interpreting his dreams? Why was Joseph the type of truly gifted seer? Why did he not only dream, but also had the power to interpret both his own dreams and the dreams of others? Simply read the lives of the two. He who runs may read. In all true power it is, after all, living the life that tells. And in proportion as one lives the life, does he not only attain to the highest power and joy for himself, but he also becomes of even greater service to all the world. One need remain in hell no longer than he himself chooses to. And the moment he chooses not to remain longer, not all the powers in the universe can prevent his leaving it. One can rise to any heaven he himself chooses, and when he chooses to rise, all the higher powers of the universe combine to help him heavenward. When one awakes from sleep and so returns to conscious life, he is in a peculiarly receptive and impressionable state. All relations with the material world have for a time been shut off. The mind is in a freer and more natural state, resembling somewhat a sensitive plate where impressions can readily leave their traces. This is why many times the highest and truest impressions come to one in the early morning hours 
before the activities of the day and their attendant distractions have exerted an influence. This is one reason why many people can do their best work in the early hours of the day. But this fact is also a most valuable one in connection with the molding of everyday life. The mind is at this time as a clean sheet of paper. We can most valuably use this quiet, receptive, impressionable period by wisely directing the activities of the mind along the highest and most desirable paths, and thus, so to speak, set the pace for the day. Each morning is a fresh beginning. We are, as it were, just beginning life. We have it entirely in our own hands. And when the morning with its fresh beginning comes, all yesterdays should be yesterdays with which we have nothing to do. Sufficient is it to know that the way we lived our yesterday has determined for us our today. And again, when the morning with its fresh beginning comes, all tomorrows should be tomorrows with which we have nothing to do. Sufficient to know that the way we live our today determines our tomorrow. Every day is a fresh beginning. Every morn is the world made new. You who are weary of sorrow and sinning, here is a beautiful hope for you, a hope for me and a hope for you. All the past things that are past and over, the tasks that are done and the tears that are shed, yesterday's errors let yesterday cover, yesterday's wounds which smarted and bled, are healed with the healing which might has shed. Let them go since we cannot relive them, cannot undo and cannot atone, God in his mercy receive, forgive them. Only the new days are our own. Today is ours and today alone. Here are the skies all burnished brightly. Here is the spent earth all reborn. Here are the tired limbs springing lightly to face the sun and to share with the morn in the chrism of dew and the cool of dawn. Every day is a fresh beginning. Listen, my soul, to the glad refrain, and in spite of old sorrow and older sinning and puzzles forecasted and possible pain, take heart with the day and begin again. Simply the first hour of this new day with all its richness and glory, with all its sublime and eternity-determining possibilities, and each succeeding hour as it comes, but not before it comes. This is the secret of character building. This is the simple method which will bring anyone to realization of the highest life that can even be conceived of. And there is nothing in this connection that can be conceived of that cannot be realized somehow, some when, somewhere. This brings such a life within the possibilities of all, for there is no one, if really in earnest and if he really desires it, who cannot live to his highest for a single hour. But even though there should be, if he is only earnest in his endeavor, then through the law that like builds like, he will be able to come a little nearer to it the next hour, and still nearer the next, and the next, and sooner or later comes the time when it becomes the natural and any other would require the effort. In this way, 
one becomes in love and in league with the highest and best in the universe. And as a consequence, the highest and best in the universe becomes in love and in league with him. They aid him at every turn. They seem literally to move all things his way because forsooth, he has first moved their way. This is David with Practice Love Media, and this has been Wisdom and Interior Illumination, Part 5 from Ralph Waldo Trines, In Tune with the Infinite. Thank you for listening and viewing to Practice Love Media. We invite you to subscribe. Peace. Namaste. Practice love.